So further on, I'd like to introduce Hamid Ali. As already mentioned, uh, Hamid Ali writes under the pen name A.H. Armas. He was born in Kuwait in 1944, and at the age of 18, he moved to the U.S. to study at the University of California in Berkeley. Hamid was working on his PhD in physics when he reached a turning point in his life and destiny that led him to inquire into a psychological and spiritual aspects of the human nature rather than the physical nature of the universe. He left his academic world uh, to pursue an in-depth journey of inner discovery, applying this, uh, his scientific precision and discipline to personal experiential research. This included study with different teachers and different modalities, extensive reading and continuous study of his own consciousness in an effort to understand the essential nature of human experience and reality in general. Hamid's process of exploration led to the creation of the Ritwan School and with Karen Johnson, who's also here in this uh, session, resulted in the founding and unfoldment of the Diamond Approach. He is an author of over 19 different books, and we're very lucky to have him here for this lecture. Uh, thank you for being here, Hamid, and welcome. Thank you, Dan Daniela. We'll begin with a short silent meditation. Just close your eyes and just be yourself until you hear the bell. Okay, we'll begin. As Daniela said, I won't be teaching Zogchen. I'm not a teacher of Zogchen and, and Zogchen, you can't teach Zogchen unless you're authorized by a qualified uh, lama or a master of Zogchen. And neither do I wish to teach it, that's not my place. But I've been involved for many years, for decades, and uh, studied it, learned it, studied with different lamas. And so I have some both understanding and experiential realization of its, uh, let's call it its uh, awakened state. And uh, I know what's involved in it and the different uh, streams in it. And I mean, I'm not going to be talking about a different uh, stream and lineages. Uh, Zogchen is uh, over 2000 years old. It has developed a great deal. Actually, it began, you know, in a, one of the most ancient texts, you know, the Kunji Chaba says at the beginning, that Zogchen cannot be taught, there are no method, that any method will only delay you. However, Zogchen developed by creating all kinds of methodology and meditations and practices and lineages and teachers, and because people could, couldn't get it by not doing anything at all. Anyway, so by now it's a quite a big tradition, especially in the 
in Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism in general. And that um, it is the non-dual teaching, the primary non-dual teachings in Mahayana Buddhism, in Buddhism in general. And it has uh, similarities to other non-dual teachings like Advaita Vedanta, but also has many differences. Because it is really, it has different understandings of reality. It's even what's considered the ultimate state to be realized is different than it is like an Advaita Vedanta and other tradition. So what am I going to do? I basically have some observations and some commentaries I want to make about how I see how Dzogchen has been developed, introduced in the West, developed, how it is taught and practiced, and uh, how is it? How does it approximate to the way it originally was taught and practiced in its home, Tibet? My intention is to help those interested in it, practicing it or understanding it, to how to can work with it more effectively. Hopefully, to be effective the way it was effective uh, in developing great masters in Tibet. It is quite a rich teaching with many details, with many practices, with many lineages, many masters for many years. And um, it is uh, considered uh, part of one of the, part of what's called the Nigma school of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism has basically four Buddhist teach uh, schools and then there's a bond school, which is the fifth one. But the four uh, Buddhist schools in Tibet, one of them is the Nagma, which is the oldest one, the first one that got established, got established by Padmasambhava in Tibet, who was invited by the king of Tibet, to brought Buddhism, and he started what's called the Nagma. Nagma tradition, and Nagma tradition has uh, many teachings, and they basically put them into nine uh, stages or nine yogas. The ninth one, the pinnacle of them is Sakchan, sometimes called the Ati Yoga or the Great Perfection. And my attempt to give my understanding that hopefully helpful, I'm trying to be helpful here, and I'm not trying to really add anything to Sakchan helpful to the way it is practiced and understood, is I'm using uh, something very well known uh, in uh, Dzogchen, which is the, the three statements of Garab Dorja, the founder of, uh, of Dzogchen and the Tibetan tradition. And, uh, he was, he came, I think, born about 200 years after Sakyamuni Buddha. And there are all kinds of stories and mythologies around him. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but at the time of his death, uh, when he was dying and basically moving into what they call the rainbow body, he was the first person to have developed what's called the rainbow body, which is the physical body, changing into a body of light. He gave uh, his main uh, students, Minjushri Mitra, uh, the last teaching, a very pith, what's called the pith instruction, three essential points. And that's what I'm going to use, those three essential points of Garabda, which is basically sums up really what Dzogchen is, how it is, it in, what is the structure of the teaching, how it, what are its stages, and um, what's involved in it. So my, one of the first encounters with uh, a Sakchan teacher was uh, with uh, Norbo Rinpoche. I had a Lama before that who was teaching us Sakchan without saying he was teaching it. The name Sakchan wasn't being used at that time when I was first learning about it. But first I heard the name Sakchan from Norbo Rinpoche. 
So I met so in San Francisco, he went to San Francisco, he was giving, he was young at that time, you know, he died a few years ago in Italy. He came to San Francisco, he was, he was one of those um, tukus or reincarnate lamas. And, uh, and he was introducing suction to the West in a way that is, was not taught in Tibet. He thought because of the characteristic of suction, which is many of the other what's called yana, the non-yanas of, of, of uh, uh, like each one of them is sort of has a lot of culture and iconography and uh, difficult to separate from the actual culture and the uh, times and uh, mythology and all of that. And, but Sokchan has a very pure teaching of what is the true condition of reality, what is the true uh, nature. And he thought just he could teach that and forget about all the cultural thing and Sokchan is the easy to do that. And it is a direct teaching doesn't require uh, the teaching itself doesn't have all the visualizations and all of the things that other yogas and tantras and Tibetan Buddhism has. So he thought that would be the best, most suitable thing for the West. And many lamas, others came after him, follow suit. Many of them, not all of them. And one thing he talked about was that Dzogchen, uh, the way it is taught, it is for the most, uh, the people, for people with superior intelligence, meaning Dzogchen divides people into sort of middling intelligence, uh, less intelligent and more intelligent, severe intelligent, middle intelligence and inferior intelligence, and it is for the superior intelligence. So he introduced that this is for most intelligent people. And as a result, what I saw is that all the, many of the intellectuals in the Western world thought, well, that's for us. We are the smart people. So he ended up having many intellectual people, very highly intelligent, brilliant people. And, uh, that is my first observation, because he and actual auction does say it that way, and many of the translation talk about it that it is for the division to three kinds of intelligence, and it is for the most intelligent and most brilliant. So many of those intelligent or smart people followed the teaching, they, they received the transmission, which are called direct introduction from the great lamas at that time. It weakens and retreats. And uh, however, my observation, and I think you will hear it from them if you talk to them, it is rare to find one and there was who really learned it to the point of full realization. Even though there were many smart people were following it. Because remember, Dzogchen and the Nagma is the ninth nine yanas. Usually the traditional way that people start from the first yana, second yana, and they spend a few years in each one of them. Then they get uh, introduced into the ninth yana, which is the yana means vehicle and then receive the Dzogchen teaching, the great perfection teaching. One thing I think is uh, wanted to comment on is that the expression of intelligence, superior intelligence, middle intelligence, free intelligence, I doubt that the Tibetan word is really intelligence. I doubt that the teachers of Dzogchen meant higher IQ. 
which is the way Western people took it. If I, if my, from my understanding of spirituality, from my understanding of the Tibetan Lama, the Zogden teaching, then it's not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of spiritual maturity, uh, of spiritual development and preparation. So higher intelligence meant greater maturity, the, the, the consciousness of the individual is spiritually mature to be able to receive and retain the teaching. And that is really true in all deeper teaching with mankind that you need the, great, uh, the soul or the individual consciousness need to be prepared, need to be mature. And the maturation happens through life experience, through practices, through long involvement in a path uh, meditation, contemplation, studying and learning. So uh, the consciousness ripens so that when a deep state arises, happens, it has a place for it to land. Not only for it to land, for it to be understood and its value understood and for it to then to continue. And IQ doesn't really have much to do with it. So I'm going to be discussing Dzogchen and the main stages of it by using the Garab Doja three essential bond points. And the idea of Dzogchen and the way Garab Doja taught it is that he it teaches about the enlightened state, which is called origin, the self-originated intrinsic awareness that in Tibetan called Rigpa. And the idea is that this teaching go, goes beyond the laws of karma and law of cause effect, because generally in Buddhism, you have to finish your karma, to go through your karma, all your karma, and then you're able to get an enlightened state. And uh, Zogchen says, you don't need to do that this because the uh, Zogchen state Rigpa, is not a causal state. It's, it's matter, not a matter of cause and fact. So it, one can be realized in one lifetime um, through uh, recognizing this condition of pure awareness. The three essential points, first I'll say them in the, the short way he gave them. And then I'll give more commentaries in them by different teachers that gives more understanding because there are many commentaries by different masters you know, throughout the ages about what he meant. What did these mean? Because he gave it in a very pith instruction, short. The first one, one is introduced directly to one's own nature. One is introduced directly to one's own nature. Second one, one definitely decides, decides upon this unique state. Third one, one continues directly with confidence and liberation. Now, Seems simple, seems so. The three main points about Dzogchen, which it's true about all the kind of Dzogchen, regardless whether, whether you're in Semde, uh, whether it's Toga, all of these points are true about all the various lineages and streams and methodologies. Let's get Nurbu version of three essential points. First one, direct and direct, is the primordial to the primordial state is transmitted straight away by the master to the disciple. The master always remains in the primordial state, and the presence of the state communicates itself to the disciple in whatever situation activity they may share. I mean, the master is always in this state, and by being with the student, it's communicated. The actual transmission, when they do it, uh, the malama, they, they do a whole ritual, usually, of 
that becomes called direct introduction and the teacher student can receive the state and, and can recognize it if they are prepared. So, second point, according to uh, Nervo, it's a cyber enter to the non-dual contemplation and, exp and experiencing the primordial state no longer remains in any doubt as to what it is. So he adds to it, the first one is, is, is the transmission, second one he said, there's no more doubt. Third one, the disciple continues in the state of the non-dual contemplation, primordial state, bringing contemplation into every action until that which is every individual true condition from the beginning, but which remains obscured by dualistic vision is made real or realized when continues right up to total realization. So what is obscured become explicit and it one continues in it. But uh, so that's so far the three th points, I'm gonna take the point one by one, which will take us some time to get more clearly about what it is. First one, one is introduced directly to one's own nature. I wanna give the commentary that uh, Dujum Rinpoche gave. Dujum is one of the great Zogchen masters at the end of the last century. He was the first leader of uh, Nigma. Uh, school in Tibetan Buddhism and Nigma, you see throughout the history didn't really have one leader. There were many lineages, many teaching, many streams. They never have a teacher, uh, leader when they move, when they had to leave Tibet and go to, to uh, India. The uh, Dalai Lama asked all the school to have a leader, choose a leader so he could bring them together so he could unify. Tibetan Buddhism into one thing. They could, all the four have their leader, they could get together, they could advise him. So the Nagma tradition chose Dujum Rinpoche, who was a very well known master at that time. So here's Dujum's uh, uh, commentary in the first statement. As for the direct introduction to one's own nature, this fresh immediate awareness of the present moment, transcending all thoughts related to the three times, is itself that primordial awareness or knowledge that is self-originated intrinsic awareness. This is the direct uh, introduction to one's own nature. So he says something about what it is, obviously. And one is introduced to it, means there is a direct transmission that one receives. That is from the golden letter written by Jan Reynolds, one of the students of so Norbo Rinpoche. And Jan, and Jan Reynolds in this golden letter, it was really the book he wrote it about uh, another mass of patrol Rinpoche's discussion of the three essential points in Sakja in general. So he makes a commentary on what Pato Rinpoche wrote, who lived in the 19th century. He says the first essential points instruction in Sakja always begins with such direct introduction. So instruction in, in Sakja always begins with direct introduction, which is very different from what we've seen like in Advaita uh, Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, the teacher talks and gives stories and challenges and answer question. It, is, it doesn't always begin by a formal uh, transmission. Here it's always it begins by a formal transmission. He said, always begins with direct introduction. By means of direct interaction, one may come to understand the real meaning of initiation, which is not just some sort of ceremony. Initiation, initiation is in fact a transmission. So basically, John Reynolds, he says by direct interaction, they mean direct transmission. 
It would be good to see this doctrine differ from many other non-dual teachings like the Vedanta, uh, starting with the transmission from a realized teacher of the state of realization of doctrine, seen as pure awareness of presence. And different teachers have different description of it, but they all agree it is Tibetan called Rigpa, and uh, which means direct knowing, but it is understood as pure, it is uh, the primordial state, it is self-origin, means not created by anything else. And it is one's uh, unfabricated awareness that is transparent, uh, empty clarity that is unbounded uh, expanse of empty clarity. So both emptiness and clarity are inseparable in it. You see, if when you remember the Advaita Vedanta, the condition is. Uh, Satchitananda, which is uh, being conscious and bliss. Here in the auction, it's not being, it's emptiness, which is non-being consciousness and bliss. So that's a very big difference between the two. And of course, Dzogchen is considered Buddhism and Buddhism emphasizes emptiness, which Advaita Vedanta doesn't emphasize. But makes the the teaching, the practices, and all that, very different. Sakchan has many practices, very different from uh, the Veda Vedanta, which many of the schools don't have real practices, just the interaction with the guru. The point is that in the Sakchan, the first essential point is that the student first receive the enlightened state, whether they study it or not, that's not the important thing, then they receive it directly in their consciousness and they recognize it. They get to know it in one's experience. There are two main points in the first essential statement, Garabdorja. First, that the student receives the enlightened state through direct transmission by a realized Lama or teacher. Second is what this enlightened state of Dzogchen is. I'll give you a different <clears throat> rendition of what this Dzogchen state from uh, Dujam Rinpoche, who I studied and extensively from his book, Wisdom Nectar. In this way, a naturally great perfection is present as the nature of mind that transcends ordinary mind. The uncompounded clear light of wisdom that is awareness in which all qualities of the essential nature are spontaneously present. In another quote, realize the all-inclusive natural state and encompassing pervasive space is inexpressible, empty clarity. This is great perfection and conceivable view. Another master, Lok Champa, from the 14th century, was one of the great masters and writers. That's how he described it. The state of pure and total presence is the clear light, the pure fact of awareness, non-conceptual, ever fresh awareness. This is from a book called You Are the Eyes of the World. <clears throat> the fact that it is non-dual is clear by these first, next verses by Long Champa. He says, all that is has me, universal creativity, pure and total presence as its root. How things appear is my being. How things arise is my manifestation. So this is an unduality of awareness and manifestation, which also shows how even manifestation has no duality in it. So non-duality both vertically and horizontally. I myself had this direct introduction to the state by many Rinpoche, including Narbo Rinpoche, 
you know, mostly uh, the, the, the most complete I have uh, from the Pinot Rinpoche, who's the third leader of the, of the Negma school, who came to the US and I went to some, to some of his teaching. And, uh, and he taught the, the, the nine yana, the introduction to the, all the nine yanas. When he got to the ninth, ninth yana, he manifested uh, as initiation, the suction state, the Rikpa. I received the transfer of many other Rinpoches, and each one of them I could see there's a little difference in terms of depth, uh, extent, clarity, some more uh, emptiness, some more of the clarity, some more presence, some more of emptiness. So each uh, Lama has slight different realization of it, but there is generally the transparent awareness and the emptiness is always there as part of it. So the comment I want to make here is first we need to see that the way the Lamas in Tibet learn it is through transmit is by first studying and practicing many yogas and tantras. At least they had to do years of preparation that included the preliminary practices, what's called nodros. Getting transmission without such preparation is possible, but whether it it will have the same effect whether one actually receives the Zakhtan state, the pure presence, empty awareness is questionable without such great lot preparation, which is the way it was done in uh, Tibet. And remember, in, in the, those Tibetan masters, they are born young as a reincarnate Lama, many of them are called Tukus, and they are taught, the, the prepared, since they were children, until, until they reach a certain state, and then their main teacher introduces them to the state of the Dzogchen. So the preparation is, is like much of their first two decades of their life before they are really introduced to the state. So it tells you how much preparation. So in the West, you just go there, no problem, you don't know. You know probably just somebody tell you, oh, this, 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 this is the auction master, he come here and you go there, you get the introduction and people think, well, I go get the direct introduction from this Lama and that Lama, maybe I go to a week in a retreat and that way I'll get the auction realization. Obviously, it hasn't worked that well that way because that uh, obviously it is not done the way it was supposed to be done. The way the Tibetan learned how to do it, regardless of what the Nurbu and other lamas believed, didn't work. I mean, as I said, Nurbu himself realized it wasn't working. I think now Lam, some of the lamas have wisened up about this. They're trying to teach some of the preliminary practices and some of the uh, preparation. Uh, they might give the Dzogchen introduction, but they give uh, many other practices bes beside that to help the students. And I don't know how much it is really done, but it is not known that they really truly realize Western person realize in the suction condition. My understanding is that uh, this is one reason why most Western students who received transmission and teaching from great Lama did not develop realization and some feel left with no guidance or support. Because in, in Tibet, they have a whole infrastructure, uh, monasteries, Lama, school, meditation in caves for 10 years or so. That didn't, doesn't exist in the West, doesn't even exist now in India, for instance. So even the Tibetans are not getting the 
uh, the support to practice the way the ancient teachers had to, to uh, support, they had to get uh, the preparation and the support to practice, to develop into great Zogchen masters. Okay, let's go to the second essential point, which is one definitely decides upon this unique state. So in the face of it, it sounds like one knows the essential state from direct introduction and just need to decide at some point that that is really my true nature. That is me, that is the ultimate. I doubt that Karab Dorja meant it this way. I doubt he meant decide because decision is a mental thing. And recognition of, of any realized state is something, is, is a pure direct recognition and discovery of, of, uh, of a spiritual condition. That is not a decision, it's not like the state and you decide that is me. It is, you know it by experiencing it. You know, uh, as we saw uh, Nurbo's rendition, he said there no longer remains doubt, any doubt in the state. That, so what does that mean? So that's more about, well, it's not a matter of deciding that there will be no doubt that that is my true condition. You know, Dijam sometimes use the word decision, sometimes use the word ascertainment. And so what, and that is one reason why I decided to do this talk is that when I hear, I read many of the books, they talk about the second point, one decide, this is, I said, decision is, does not, is not a factor in mystical states. Here's what Reynolds says in his commentary in Bhattu Rinpoche. The second statement speaks of arriving at a single definitive decision or discovery. But in the case of Dzogchen, this is not something that we decide intellectually. However, if we have actually discovered something through our own personal experience, then there is no question of coming to a decision intellectually because we have already determined for ourselves its real condition. I'll give you my understanding, which is there are a few things here, not just one thing. First, the question of decision. We need to recognize that no realization or awakening is a matter of one deciding something, as I just said. You cannot decide what is fundamentally true. So Reynolds is right here that it is a matter of discovery. But we have been already introduced to it. We have already gotten in transmission. So we already experienced it. So what does it mean that uh, we, it's a discovery? The way I understand it is that the direct introduction is the teacher basically gives you a gift. You will learn it by experiencing the emanation and manifestation of the master. And the second essential point, what it means is that you really discover it on your own. First, you learn it from the, from the master, and then it arises naturally in, in, in you, in your own aloneness, in your own independence. So you, it is independent from anybody else, independent even from your mind. And that is where, where the certainty comes, where the sense of verification happens. 
It doesn't depend on what other people say. It doesn't, it's not a matter of decision. It's a matter of, of a, an independent discovery. You might have known it before, but it was given to you. This is the same thing as the Sufi thing about state and state and, uh, uh, and a station. The state is a gift from God. Station is something that happens from your own uh, work, from your own uh, practice. So it's a matter of independently experiencing it and independently verifying it. I'm sure this is not news to people like Dujum, Nurbo, or various Dr. Masters. They all know that recognizing pure awareness is a discovery and a recognition at some point and need to be independent, not only from others, but from one's mind. I'm sure many of them have taught it, taught it and written about it that way. The second part is about sustaining the state, which is again the maturation as it needs. Second point here, not only you discover it, you're able to sustain it, you're able to continue with it, able to continue arising in meditation or in practice or, or contemplation, they call it. So the first uh, statement about momentous awakening, the second fa phase is about the power of practice that make it arise on its own and continues to arise. And the state becomes more permanent. Now, now to, for it to become permanent is not a little thing. This is uh, a realization of Zakshan state, not simply experiencing it as from a transmission. And not many get to the second stage of the path. And there is a story about Delgu Kensa. He himself said that Delgu Kensa is one of the great masters of, uh, of um, Zakshan. Uh, who followed Dujum as uh, the leader of the Enigma uh, school or sect, a uh, beloved master. And he meditated for, you know, nine years or so in a cave and meditated, practiced, studied, and didn't happen. Finally, he gave up. He came out and said, not working. And only when he gave up, finally it happened. It's like he had to exert himself all the way, practice everything, do everything. And then finally get to a state of total helplessness. And then the state arose at its own. And it was such a big thing that it became his natural state that sustained itself. I'll give you an example, a quote from him about how much he practiced. He said, other than going to sleep at night and going to the toilet at midday, I would not take a break even for a short time, but would write or read texts, keep meditation session, and arouse great diligence in doing prostration and mantra recitations. I'm giving you this example of Tilly Kenza to show that getting to the second state of parent realization and recognition and certainty is not a little thing. I don't actually know anybody in the Western world who actually had got to this realization. Maybe there are some I don't know, but I haven't heard of them. So we need to exhaust everything. Our own efforts take us to the precipice and this makes it more likely that pure, naked, empty, clear awareness will arise as what we are in the nature of everything. It is possible to have an instantaneous Zakshan awakening, but that's not the same thing. Uh, the full realization that is permanent, uh, it is certain that we are certain it is what we are. Anyway, 
By the way, we don't have at the present time masters like Dilgo Kanto, Dojim, you know, in this, this, or the 16th Karmapa. T, that caliber of realization we don't have it now, and I think partly because uh, there isn't the infrastructure that supported the practice that Tibetan has in Tibet. Even in India, they don't have it the same way. So even the Tibetan masters now, they're not the same, uh, not in the same caliber as the 16th Karmapa or Dujum or Dilgu Kensa or many of the others. The great master either died or dying. We have second generation master, Tibetan master, and of course the Western teachers who have been so authorized to teach it. The third essential point. Okay, so basically what I said that the first essential point is the transmission and that the transmission Definitely from what most people in the West think about, you need a great deal of preparation for that transmission to really, for you to receive the transmission in the full way. And the second point is the discovery on your own and the direct ascertainment that this is the truth of what I am. But what we've seen is that to move from the first point, from the direct, from learning it from the teacher to having it arise in you as a permanent certain thing is not a little thing. It took, it took Delgu Kenza nine years or so of practice to really get there. And that's one of the great masters. And so imagine, you know, many of us Westerners, uh, how are we going to do it? I mean, we don't even have time to meditate. He was spending <laughs> nine years completely dedicated to that in a cave. I mean, his, his example might be extreme, but it, many of the masters of Tibet, that's how they've done it. That's how, how they have great, amazing masters whose presence, like I remember Nirbo Rinpoche, I'm not Nirbo, I mean the Pinot Rinpoche, when he, when he arrived to the Dzogchen state, the great perfect, he said, this is, and he said a few words, the whole room transformed into that condition. Now the third essential point, which says one continues directly with confidence and liberation. That's what Karab Dor just said. What does that mean? But the second essential point was about continuing the state of liberation or pure awareness. So what is new here? Here's a nerve virgin. The disciple continues in the state of non-dual contemplation, the primordial state, bringing con con contemplation into every action and to that which is which is every individual true condition from the beginning but which remains obscure is made real or realized so one brings it into every action so it's not a matter about continuing simply continuing the state of meditation, but rather continuing it in action. This is what I call actualization of realization, of living this realization in one's personal life with this action and interaction. This is Reynolds' commentary. Having been directly introduced to Rekpa and having re removed all doubt with regard to it, through effectively practicing meditation, we are then able to continue confidently in the state of self liberation So the, really the third essential point is about bringing the liberated state into life and activity. Because the second point is about having it be continuous, but that is in meditation and practice. But now it's about life, about action, interaction, and living, and expression. This means continuing in the state during which, during such activities and expressing it by coming from it. 
obviously this is a continuing long stage that could last for the rest of one's life. There is no end of how integrated the pure awareness and, and presence into one's life. There are always life situations that might challenge us and we might become somewhat disconnected or forget what and who we truly are. This stage requires an instruction teaching, continuing meditation, and undergoing many practices and, and that integrate it in everyday activities. It is constant self-remembering where more of more of the state is expressed in one's life. It is the integration of the awakened state in one's conduct. This is a stage actually that many who have become awakened in any of the tradition, not just doctrine, encounter after true realization. First you're awakened, then you realize that when you become permanent, and then how to live it, which is called living out of the state which is mean actualize, actualizing you. Yeah. This course continues to and through the dying process. This stage continues into this effortless, spontaneous living the awakened state. This is con considered the fruition of realization of the path of Dzogchen. There is not much for me to say about here because there's no need to. I'm not aware of any Western student practicing in this stage of living the Dzogchen, pure present everyday life in one's, in one's contact. I only try to give my understanding of what the third essential point is about. My path, of course, I'm not a Dzogchen person. I know it a lot. I study this and understand it, but I don't consider myself a Dzogchen person and my path is not really that. I see that the, both the realization, the actualization is, is, has to do with practice and also with grace, not just practice. And also, I don't necessarily agree with Dzogchen that the ultimate state is what they call rigor pure awareness. For me, that is a valid way of seeing the ultimate condition. But I also recognize there are many other realizations that can happen in, in my experience. And design. But that is not the point here. I'm really talking about Dzogchen and uh, so basically here, what I try to illustrate by using the three essential points that about the talk chain, and that first there is the transmit, direct transmission. Student received it from uh, a teacher who has a state who, who, whose presence, whose, his or her presence can impact like, by us having some taste, some experience of it. So we know there is such a thing, such a state. The second uh, such about has to do with, uh, with us meditating and practicing. So it arises in, in our own independent, uh, independent our own uh, aloneness. And it arises in such a way, such strength that we are certain that is uh, our true nature. And there is no doubt about it, there's certainty. And the third uh, stage has to do with bringing this into everyday life, into uh, living, conduct, and activity. So that is what I wanted to say so far. Let's see if there are people who have questions. Well, I said, is it possible to use them in conjunction with depth psychology? Like some of these teachings, could they be integrated with like Western methods? First of all, I'm not really going to get into the different kinds of Zogchen, like Samdain, and Negden, Toga, and all of that. There's a lot of richness there in, in uh, Zogchen if you study it. I'm giving the basic outline of the, of the whole path. Now, 
blockchain does not use psychology. Their thing is that it's direct. You just get it. And it, independent mind, independent learning, independent of anything, independent psychology, it is non-causal, does not depend on being free from karma, all of that. That's their view. Now, there might be people who does use psychology, whatever, I, I don't see why not, but that's not the way Zoktch has been practiced for the 2000 years or so. It is not psychological, it's a purely mystical path, as far as I know. The possibilities in the West, of course, being introduced differently in the West. Now there are Western teachers who have been given authorization to teach it. So some of them probably have a psychological background. They probably uh, do use some of their psychology, which I think could be useful actually. And because I think much of the preparation that the Tibetans do and through their practices, uh, you know, like the preliminary practices and all of that, is basically to deal with the psychology, but not without unpsychologically. And in the West, it could be done through psychological means. But I'm not a Zogchen teacher, so I'm not going to give really in definitive opinions since I didn't do it. But thanks for your question. Let me say some. Uh, I guess you spoke about Chugyal Namkai Norbu from Italy. Yeah. I followed Rinpoche since uh, 27 years. Yeah. Last 27 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, may, may I, I clarify two points? Good. Um, he always spoke uh, about capacity, not intelligence. Yes. Okay. So, middle and high capacity, what is for me much larger than intelligence. I, I agree with you. It's probably, you know, capacity is better translation of the hmm. original language than intelligence. Although many of the writers talk about intelligence. Yeah. Thank you. And then he, in the last 24 years, he set up an intense study program uh, called Santi Sangha, which I followed also for 20 years to train deep understanding of Dzogchen. But we never, we, we never did prostrations or this kind yeah. of preliminary practices, but we did deepening uh, all the Dzogchen practices of same day, long day and Upadesha. Uh -huh. And I never heard him say that his teaching did not work. So, but then I have a question. In the Western world, for me, it's not so easy to integrate presence in every moment. It's, I guess it's, it was much easier in Tibet in, uh, in, uh, in, this, in this kind of uh, uh, yeah, tradition to practice it. Yeah, they were, they were not too busy like us. Yeah. <laughs> All kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. And concerning the third point of Garab Dorje, I find you teaching so useful and also for integrating the personal and the non-dual vision. Yeah. Because the personal is, is a little missing in the Tsukchen. Do you think that Tsukchen and Ridwan has a kind of close heart relationship and can go hand in hand? There is a connection because really Dzogchen is one of the um, non-dual teaching who do, first of all, they have those stages of uh, first knowing the state, then ascertaining it, and then actualizing it, living it in one's life, which is similar to the way we do it in our work. 
And also, uh, Dzogchen frequently refers to their condition as some kind of presence, pure presence, which, which Norbo used a lot, in, uh, or at least has translated, used the word presence. And many of the other Buddhist teachings don't talk about presence, they just talk about pure awareness. You know, and, and presence is what we use in Diamond Approach because really, Rigpa, the, the word Rigpa that uh, Tibetan use for the primordial state or the pure state is, is um, closest thing to what we call presence. It is self knowing awareness, you see, uh, awareness that knows itself. They call it, you know pure knowing or whatever. And that is a similarity too. And um, there are, yes, I mean, there are similarities and parallels, but also at uh, the same time, uh, Sokchen is really oriented uh, differently than, uh, than our teaching, than approach. Sokchen is really toward, uh, is oriented toward realizing the primordial state, which is more of a transcendent condition, as you said, not personal. To, to be able to have this transcendent condition to be permanent and it's transcendent with its Dharmakaya and, you know, some Bogakaya and Nirma, all these things, but the Dharmakaya is the body of truth that is the, the deepest nature, the deepest way of experiencing the awareness and that to become permanent. Although that is something we know in our work and we experience it, we have also the personal life the importance of the personal life. And because we live in the West where personal life is important in Tibet, you know, they had a lot of time. And especially if you were a monk or nun and living in a monastery, being in transcendent state, no problem. You don't need to do all these other things. You don't need to work. You don't have schedule. You don't have email. You don't, <laughs> you don't do any of those things. So you have a lot of, I mean, I remember, you know, when my teacher will give us those practices, I remember, you know, one <laughs> time for two months, every day he will give us two, three practices. Each one of them, he said, you do it for two hours a day. And then when we counted <laughs> at the two months, how many hours it will take to do all of them every day, there is not enough hours in the day to do them. <laughs> but I think that shows that that the hours and hours of practicing that is needed, that it was done in the Tibet, is something we cannot do in the, in the West. And the diamond approach doesn't really do that. It uses the practice of inquiry, which you do all the time. You don't have to be in any particular state. So there are similarities, but there are differences, but there I, I love Dzogchen, I, I respect it a lot. I think it's a great teaching, it was a great, um, quite a contribution to spirituality, to humanity. And it's one of the most developed non-dual teachings. Many people these days know about Advaita Vedanta and other non-dual teachings. Dzogchen is actually much more developed, has much more richness, and much more variety in this, as you mentioned, different kinds. Okay, good talking to you. Many thanks. I don't know if I misinterpreted what you said, but um, I, I heard you say that there there weren't at this time in the West the uh, level of Dzogchen teachers that had been in Tibet years ago. And where what I thought I heard you say, and maybe I just went there, was that there really weren't any realized 
Western teachers. And if that is so, then it would be useless for us to be on the path of Vajrayana because we couldn't receive the transmission from an enlightened being. Did I hear you correctly? Am I, and, and, and am I, you know? Well, there are two things I said about Western teachers and about Tibetan teachers. Yes. The Western teachers, I said, I'm not aware of any Western teachers of Dzogchen who has the kind of realization that I remember in Dujum or Diligu Kenza, uh, nothing comes close yes. to that. Right. And nobody is claiming to have it, too. Yes, okay. Nobody is claiming it. And also I said about even the Tibetan Lamas, the younger Tibetan Lamas, they are not as realized as, uh, they are not in the same caliber of realization. They have realization, they do, they can give the introduction, the transmission of the Dzogchen state, but they're not similar in terms of maturity and uh, capacity and realization and expansion as somebody as Dujum or uh, Diligu Kanza. Because, and I think it's not their fault, it's sort of their, their, their condition don't allow it. They basically, uh, since they do it in India or Nepal, whatever, they don't have the infrastructure and the culture that they had in Tibet. So they go and maybe take a year meditation in a retreat and take a study for a little while. And then in their 20s, they're sent to the West to teach. So they don't spend like 10, 20 years in, in a cave meditating. So of course they don't develop to the extent. So as a result, as I said, I don't see that caliber of realization of, of Tibetan teacher who come on in the West. There might be some, still some of the old guards and still there in, in the East, but I don't see them coming to the West, you know. So, so what about a, a Tibetan who studied from the time he was a young child in a monastery and then comes to the West to teach? If they like, studied and they've done really, if they've, uh, I, I'm not aware of anybody who's like that, who really spent like eight, nine years uh, I see. in a cave and meditating yes. continuously. I, I don't hear of anybody like that. Yes. They, I see. They actually, they just don't have that kind of infrastructure in, in the way they had it before. You know, mm -hmm. They don't have the time, they don't have resources, they don't have the physical structure to do it. So, Tibet, so the Tibetan teaching, the Vajrayana, is in some sense, many people, they think it's in the decline because of that. Mm. And, and, and I'm sure the Dalai Lama and others, they're doing their best to, for, to make it continue and be a strong, and I wish them well. But really, the, the, their situation is not easy. I see. Thank and, you. There is the dedication, the love, all of that, but you need the opportunity to practice. Mm -hmm. People like uh, Dilgu Kenza, they practice for a long time. Some others practice for like 20 years before they really started teaching. Mm -hmm. And now the, they're sent young in their 20s to teach in the West. When did they have time to meditate for 10, 10 years? Thank you. I appreciate yeah. this. So this is an, what I call an outside view of Zogchen in the West. Not an inside. There might be other people who know things I don't know about, about the Tibetan of Zogchen. And, you know, because there are monasteries and there are teachers and all of that still exists and they're trying to keep the tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we would just get a mini transmission, 
so to speak. Yeah, we get, I think there are many teachers who teach it still. It's one of the main non-dual teaching in the West. And that's why I'm talking about it, because it's widespread. Many people study with Tibetan Lama, people go study with Western Lamas or teachers, and I'm sure they learn something. Are they going to get the same teaching as they could have gotten from Dujja or uh, Dilka Kenza is my question, you see. Yes. I, I hope somebody knows that I'm wrong and that there are people like that who are teaching it. But it is, maybe that was a time that is past now. Thank you. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Uh, my question has to do with the first step, the uh, arising of the the idea of Dogshin. Um and it has to do the with first the, uh, statement. You mean? Yeah, the first statement. The direct introduction. Yeah. Yeah, the direct introduction exactly, yeah. and and it. My question relates to. Bodhidharma's quote that a special transmission, that Zen is a special transmission outside the scriptures, not depending on words and letters, directly pointing to the mind, seeing into one's true nature and attaining Buddhahood. Seems to me that these are directly connected Well, the, Dharma, the Zen is a different kind of thing than uh, that, than Dzogchen, a very different, different stream. I mean, it is be, Zen is the idea is, is has nothing to do with books and studying and all of that. And it's true, Dzogchen says it doesn't depend on uh, on the studying and all of that. However, Dzogchen depends on direct transmission. Uh, Zen doesn't say that. But a special transmission is equivalent yeah. to a direct transmission. Yeah, it's the same thing. No, I mean, uh, special transmission, uh, the, the way it's Zen is that you practice uh, meditation. And by practicing meditation, you get to get the realization. And Dzogchen, no, you get the state right away from the master at the beginning. I get and it. then that tells you how to meditate. Okay, thank you. I, yeah. I think we've crossed paths before. I yeah. studied with Claudio as well in oh, uh, yeah. 74. We might have been in the same class in Berkeley. And might have been, yes. Yeah, man, uh, that's the interesting job. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, uh, good, thank you for your talk. And good, thank good, you for to, good to see you then. Yeah, it's been it's been a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah, I've I've, I've yeah. kind of followed your teachings through the years uh, and done some insight inquiry, which I like very much. Yeah, the, so the next been, lecture will be more about Zen. I'll be talking about Dogen, the Zen master. Dogen is wonderful. I love yeah. Dogen. Yes, yeah. thank you. That's this next time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your lecture and thank you for letting me ask a question. My question is a little bit more general and perhaps um, perhaps when I join you in the next lecture, it will be more pertinent to ask this question, but let me put it. I'm just I'm curious to see, um, or, or how you see, um, how all of these traditions, these spiritual traditions fit in with uh, the modern knowledge we have of, of the, the brain and consciousness, all of these things that are being developed, um, perhaps with our more understanding of the central nervous system and all the work that has been done on trauma. I wonder if you see all of this knowledge as contrib... I mean, I can see what you mean about mystical and experimental, but do you see in some way this knowledge is contributing to... Um, our spiritual development, how we see it. 
I know, for instance, that the Dalai Lama has been having conferences with scientists and researchers, you know, including neuroscientists and all of that. And he found them, he finds them interesting, you know, and relevant. But it's also very clear that he makes a distinction that, that the, the Tibetan teaching, you know, the, is, uh, the, is something uh, that is, uh, cannot be encompassed by uh, neurological understanding or understanding of the brain or consciousness uh, the way modern theories of consciousness take it, that they're uh, just like other mystical teachings, that really that to connect with the spiritual nature or the, the nature of being is something that is beyond the mind, first of all. That's all they all say is in the of the mind. But it's, uh, it's beyond the nervous system, but obviously nervous system is important in the sense it is how we experience things with the physical body, right? When the state itself, uh, you see that the body and the whole nervous system is a, is a product of the spiritual state. You know, it is, uh, is not really a spiritual state in some sense, like Rigpa here, pure awareness, is something, I say original, primordial, it's, the brain cannot be considered primordial, is an evolutionary product. While primordial is inherently there at any time. And so it's a different category of, uh, of uh, unknowing. Now, you know, us Westerners, since we know about all these things, we could try to see them and connect them, which I think makes sense. But when we get into the state, the state seems beyond the body. Not that the body is not relevant, but it is sort of the nature of the body. Just like the atoms are the nature of the cells, the pure awareness is the nature of the physical world. So you can, so in some sense, it is seen as more fundamental than the physical. Mm -hmm. The physical is secondary. That is how those teachings look at it. I'm not saying that's how I look at it. You know, for me, I think both have their view, their different perspective of things, and each has a contribution to make. Uh, we can have hold both. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Ali. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, so, you know, from my own experience, um, it, you know, albeit a, a transitory state, not a, not a permanent state as you sometimes speak to, um, I had this experience of sort of what I call, what some call, and what I call sort of the rising of, of, of an inner teacher that speaks to you. Um, and I'm wondering if that, if there's any relationship of that uh, or any, 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 anything is spoken to regarding that as far as this teaching or any other teaching. I don't really see it um, much in the literature. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if you can speak to that or if you have any experience yourself with that or what do you mean by inner teach, teacher? Well, it's sort of like, for me, it was the appearance of, of, a, of, a, of a quiet voice that was neither demanding or lecturing or anything, but just sort of a transmission of, uh, of what I would call spiritual information, reality, which was transformative at that time for me um, in terms of opening up different spiritual states. Um, so I, I don't, do you relate to that at all? Or, I mean, maybe it's just a unique thing for some, 
um, that doesn't uh, necessarily. Um, so you were hearing a voice. You were hearing a voice. Yes. Uh huh. But not in the sense of a schizophrenic experience of like. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. But rather, I mean, some, some people have that experience. Uh huh. Okay. Your voice or see things or stuff like that. It mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. That's not usually how mystical experience happens, but that, uh, people do report those kind of experiences. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Oh, so you're, you're, you're not alone there. All right. So it's, just, it's kind of a subset of other types of experiences. That yeah, can... it's a series of kind of experiences where the, instead of a state happening, somebody hears a voice or sees light or sees a figure or something like that. Because the, the mind sometimes helps us connect. If we can't handle, if we is not prepared or how the capacity to see the state, experience the state as it is, it will appear to us in a, in a way that we can receive it. Mm -hmm. Because because the spiritual nature is compassionate and loving, and want to get to us one way or another. Right. <laughs> Well, it did lead to that sort of experience for me too, as well as um, sort of a bliss state and uh, okay, yeah, so remembering kind of condition where yeah. where actually I was, you know, it was you know, which is for me kind of like seeing the world as if you're in, you know, watching a movie in a way. It was a kind of a detachment um, that happened, and, um, and and of course an emptiness. In the mind as well, so uh, it, it did seem to be conducive to that sort of experience. For me. I was going to seem it did lead you to experiencing yourself in a different state of consciousness. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. that's what matters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And great to see you. Thank you. I'm calling from New Orleans, and my question is about when I'm deep in meditation. I sometimes experience brief flashes of Rigpa. And do you have any advice in how to make these moments more frequent, longer in duration, with the eventual goal of making this a more permanent state? Well, there, there's auction approach, and there is what I do. <laughs> Not exactly a thing. A auction approach is that you continue the meditation. And just as Tilko Kansi said, he spent all his time trying to practice to make that possible. And, uh, and of course, auction uh, has many other practices that, that help visualization. The way I will do it is to inquire with oneself to find out what's in the way. Mm -hmm. What's in the way to find out what's in the way, what's limiting the experience. And that is more a psychological question because what's in the way is a belief, a certain kind of sensitivity that's not there. Is there some kind of a pattern of mind or that is in the way. So if you see what's in the way, it becomes more possible for this state to emerge more, more frequently, more continually. Thank you. You're and welcome. in my case, I do think it's a lifetime of a, a habit of believing that this person I take myself to be is the real me which yeah. I now believe to be not true. Yeah, and that is actually the, the primary obstacle for all non-dual states, in, including Dzogchen. So, I mean, Dzogchen doesn't deal with it psychologically that way, but you can, you can look at what makes you believe that. And to see, first, you recognize that you have this belief, this conviction. You want to see how deep this conviction is. Where does it come from? Because very old, right? You know, where does yes. this come from? And to see what makes you hold on to it, things like that. Until this, so it's possible for this 
what we call structure. Why well, I call this an ego structure, structure of the self. Until this structure begin to get, begin to dissolve, become more transparent, then it's easy to get uh, to have the non-dual state become more present. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I remember Hamid once you said in one of your interviews that when you discovered you discovered that not all people have the kind of curiosity and desire for discernment that you do. And, and it was a kind of a surprise when you discovered that. I can relate because ever since I was a child, I had kind of a rebellion to things just presented to me. And I always wanted to know for myself and directly. So that really went through schooling. I, I, I kind of got by with good grades because I could do it very quickly, but the curiosity, the true desire to know myself wasn't there because it was just a program. And when I read my first Diamond Heart book, I was like, oh my God, thank you, thank you. It's up to me now to know, to find out. And so non-dual traditions seem to present the aim as a ready, destination, what to shoot for. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what is this nature and function of curiosity as an actual maybe fire starter or a few or some kind of agent that allows for opening into a much wider territory? And in thinking about this question, I also realized that while I think about curiosity as mostly a, an open mind, like a mind quality, it's actually maybe even more heart quality. And so I wanted you to reflect on that a little bit and also reflect on the fact that are really all people predisposed to this kind of knowing or is that more specific to a certain built of a person? Well, I mean, curiosity I means you're, you're open to what's there to what's possible and uh, and people are different in terms how curious they are as you said and the uh, non-dual tradition they don't talk about curiosity as much as a uh, strong drive and desire or longing for for realization for liberation and it's true they have certain state they, they the teaching says you get to and they have a strong, instead of a curiosity, a strong interest, a strong desire for that. And, um, and sometimes it's for the love of the teaching or the teacher, the, the veneration and, and being quite sort of impressed or quite uh, taken by, quite inspired. That the inspiration makes one persist in their practice. So that's an alternative to curiosity, but that is, or as you said, is more oriented to a particular uh, end. Although Imnozakchen you know, Zakchen says in the practice, you don't try to get to an end. You know, their practice, ultimate practice, is you don't really do it, you're just there and you just presence, it just happens, similar to what we do. However, they do have in the teaching that the the primordial presence or pure awareness as really what is the true nature. So the student will have to be able to practice, do the meditation and forget what the teaching says, basically, which of course, that's the, the way the practice is supposed to happen. So good question about con contrasting the, the two motivations. I think my, that might be a good to stop here. We, you know, I appreciate all the questions and being with you all. And so we stop here and we'll see you next time. Please do write your questions into the blog because Amit will be able to look at that later on. Um, and there were a few really beautiful questions uh, there. So it would be quite a pity if we lose them and it's quite valuable also for other people and my colleague Steve just put them into the chat
And then let me remind you again, we will have one more lecture in this series on November 6th on the topic Dogen, the founder of Soto Zen. And I'm sure that's going to be a fun one. This will be also a longer lecture, two hours, um, also with a question and answer period in this. So please do join us for this.